Joining me on the line, she is from Illinois. I believe you're from Illinois, right? I am indeed. Ah, yeah. look at me. I'm the smartest guy in the room, which is nobody else. <laughs> uh, Sylvia Schultz is on the line with me right now. First of all, welcome to the show. We appreciate it. Uh, we got hooked up through uh, Troy Taylor, who's been on the show a couple times, uh, who I always yeah. think I always think Troy is getting sick of me because I'll reach out to him <laughs> and stuff. And I... I always feel like that. Hey, hey, you remember me? Hey, you remember me? But anyways, he was good enough to uh, point me in your direction. Uh, Sylvia, the big reason you're on, of course, is you have a new book out. Uh, you're a author. And uh, the new book is called Gone on Vacation, which we are going to get to that uh, because this is some really fascinating stuff. But uh, you're into the world of the weird like a lot of us, into the world of the paranormal, right? I most certainly am. <laughs> I have adored the weird since I was a very small child. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I say it like that, I'm saying it lovingly. In case anybody thinks I'm making fun of it, I'm I'm not. I just it's the easy way to encompass all of the weird that's out there. And the mysterious and the creepy and it's all good. Now, Sylvia, you actually uh, have authored a lot of different books. I, I do want to talk specifically about the the new one. But in general, what what kind of writing do you do? I write paranormal nonfiction. I write true ghost stories. There are three of the books in my backlog of books that deal with the Peoria State Hospital. Okay. I really believe that that's that's a haunted mental asylum in Bartonville, Illinois, which is just across the river and a little bit north of, of where I am. And you say haunted mental asylum. And your mind automatically goes all American horror story on you. <laughs> and you assume that there was pain and fear and abuse. And it is my privilege and my joy to tell people this was not the case at the Peoria State Hospital. This was a place where the patients were treated like family. Really? This is a place of deep caring and deep compassion. Oh, yes. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but you don't hear that oh, very what? often with old haunted hospitals. I know. <laughs> It, it's... That's why it is such a pleasure to write about this place. Really? Okay, so uh, when was it in operation? It was in operation from 1902 to 1973. Oh, wow. So it's got it's got a lot of history in it. And it, that probably, it does. That probably falls under the, the area of, you know, the energy you bring into a place type thing, right? Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So it's got a good uh, energy. It's a cool place to go, huh? Yeah. Fantastic place to go. Our our spirits are friendly and interactive. Most of them are friendly. <laughs> and we've got a few sour pusses hanging around the hilltop. But for the most part, they are just eager to talk and eager to interact with people. I have an absolutely wonderful story that happened to a friend of mine. Please this share. Is, uh, the idea behind fractured spirits and fractured souls is that People, I, I've had my own experiences there, but people have been generous enough to share their experiences with me, too. And these have also gone into the book. Well, I had a, a colleague, a, a publishing colleague, that wanted to go around to local libraries and visit. We had a series of books that we were promoting. We had a little publishing house of our own. So he was going to go around to local libraries. So I had him come to my library, and then I said, well, why don't you visit these to a couple of libraries as well. He's not from around here, so okay. I gave him very specific directions because I know he is a bit directionally challenged. So I gave him directions between Pekin Library and Alpha Park Library in Bartonville. Okay. And I said, okay, you're going to go up this hill. And he is a sensitive. And I said, when you go up this hill that I'm going to tell you about, put your guards up. I'm not kidding about <laughs> You're going to be driving right through the asylum grounds. So be aware of that. Okay. So he gets, I get this text from him at work when I'm at work. He said, well, was there a tuberculosis ward at this asylum you were telling me about? And I said, well, yes, it was called the Pollock Hospital. And he said, that's what I thought. I picked up a hitchhiker. <laughs> Sylvia Schultz, oh. author on the line with me right now as we talk about everything that she is into. So uh, you, I guess, what's your relationship with the uh, Peoria State Hospital? Are you a volunteer with it? Do you run it? Do you... Just investigate it. Oh, heavens no, I don't run it. Okay, okay. <laughs> I well, I just... <laughs> this is our first conversation, Sylvia. I'm trying to get the lay of the land here, okay? <laughs> this, I, there are 
many more capable people than I that are in charge of the running of the place. <laughs> I thought really great about the Peoria State Hospital is that discoveries are always being made. These historians are combing through the records that we have and the newspaper accounts that we have, and they're constantly discovering things about the history of the hospital that just cement the fact of the hospital being a very caring, understanding, wonderful place. That's crazy. They actually found a, a footage, a reel of footage from the 1960s in which the doctors and nurses and the patients had a baseball game going on oh, on a wow. Sunday afternoon, but they were playing donkey baseball. <laughs> That now that and screams it, Midwest. It's exactly, exactly what it sounds like. You hit the ball and then you hop on a donkey to run to first base, and it's just hysterical. Oh my lord! <laughs> and uh, Peoria, Peoria State Hospital, uh, I believe the website is PeoriaStateHospital dot com. Correct? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I pulled it up and I'm looking at it. It's a very interesting looking place. How many times do you think you've investigated there? Oh, holy cat! <laughs> Probably about 60 or 70 times. All right. So you're you're known there is what we're saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The spirits know me. The volunteers know me. Sylvia, how, how often do you go paranormal investigating? I try to go at least once a month. Really? I don't have a team or anything, but yeah, I try to get out in the field at least once a month. I was very fortunate this spring to be able to do three weeks of ghost hunting in England and Scotland. Really? How was that? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> it was so cool. Oh, there there were places. I, I've been to England twice mm -hmm. before this, but I was not a paranormal investigator at the time. And this was all spooks all the time. It oh, was wow. fantastic. I got to see places that I'd only read about in books. That's really cool. It was just astounding. Um, I have a podcast of my own called Lights Out. Shameless self promotion here. No, we're next... Sylvia. We're all about shameless plugs here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, the next five or six episodes I'm going to be posting on Lights Out are going to be experiences that I had in England. Oh, perfect. So, uh, we'll actually put uh, a link to that up at the website. Uh, Sylvia's website is sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. We'll have links at the bottom of the page. Uh, Sylvia is an author who's joining us today. Uh, supposed to be talking about going on vacation, but uh, I kind of wanted to talk about the paranormal, uh, more paranormal with her first. Go back real quick. You said you, at one point you weren't a paranormal investigator. What changed? What made you want to get into the world of the weird? Oh, boy. I've always been fascinated with ghost stories. I really believe that you can't understand the ghost stories of a place without knowing the history behind it. That's where Troy and I absolutely see eye to eye. <laughs> huge history geeks as it pertains to the paranormal because they just go, they're hand in glove. You cannot separate the two, I don't think. So I've always been interested in history as well, just a huge Civil War wonk ever since I was in grade school. And I, I started off writing fiction. I started off writing genre fiction, actually, horror and romance. Okay. I know, fine line between the two. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I never really got anywhere with these fiction books that I was publishing with very small presses. Um, I was contacted by another small press to write a book of true ghost stories. And from then, I just never looked back. I found my niche, and I absolutely adore doing the research for these stories and learning the history behind the stories and finding the stories and putting them all in books so that my readers can enjoy these things, too. And it was while I was working on that first book that I, I hooked up with a local group called GARD, Ghost Unit Analysis Research and Detection. Uh, Air, did they have a black T-shirt, too? Yeah. They, <laughs> all, they, they all have black T-shirts. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a, a paranormal show we do here, and we always joke around everybody that comes in. I ask them, so what came first, the, the group or the T-shirt? And it's usually always the T-shirt. We got to get T-shirts made. <laughs> so anyways, okay. I so, was so pleased. Yeah, I was so pleased to, to go to the Velisca Axe Murder House and go to their gift shop and find a T-shirt that wasn't black. Oh, <laughs> 
That's funny. Did you get a uh, chance to talk to uh, Johnny Hauser down there? Yeah. Oh, Johnny's brilliant. He's a good dude. Yeah, he I, I really a like lot Johnny. Of information. Yeah, Johnny's great. But yeah, this is about you, Sylvia. <laughs> well, that's true. So, okay. so tell us a little so, bit about yeah. Guard and what what uh, you hooked up with them for. I, the first investigation I went on with them was an investigation of the Peoria Players Theater in Peoria, Illinois, and they they were very gracious and welcomed me into their team and let me hang out and play with them. And I realized that, yes, there are people that take their Saturday nights and go to these haunted places and investigate. And sit in the dark is what um, you're saying. Yes, yes. (laughs) I like to tell people I sit in dark, spooky places so that you don't have to. (laughs) I go talk to myself in a dark room. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, listen to people who aren't there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's kind of the thing with the the ghost shows. It's always action happening all night. But I mean, if we're really honest about it, ninety percent of the time is you sitting in a dark room by yourself asking questions to the void. You know, there are a lot, lots of editing going on. <laughs> <in those laughs> shows. Oh my yes. <laughs> well, hey Sylvia, tell me this then. I mean, you you've gone out and you've done uh, you've done this stuff. Clearly, you're a believer, right? Oh, absolutely. I've had too many experiences not to believe. What What was the experience that really made you go, yeah, there's something to this? So this happened at the Peoria Players Theater. I was there investigating with a group, not guard, a different group. We had split up into several groups, and um, I was with the, the team leader, and we decided to go into the orchestra pit underneath the stage at the theater. And we're sitting there in the dark, and I was so comfortable in the dark there. And there was was just a little glow of the red glow of the recorder light. And I was so comfortable asking questions of the spirits down there that I could have curled up and went to sleep. It was really a peaceful, wonderful feeling. Okay. So after that, we came out, reconvened, and we decided to go to a different part of the theater. Now, the theater is haunted by several different spirits. The main spirit there is a former director named Norman N. Dean. He was a director there in the early 1960s, passed away from cancer when he was very young. He's only about 33 years old. But he loved the theater so much that he has never left. Wow. There are several other spirits in the theater. There is a woman who hangs around in the costume department. She's the one we are talking to under the stage. But there's also a very nasty critter that hangs out kind of up in the corner of the upper stage. And I had been told stories about this entity, how he's a bully. He likes it. He followed one of the theater volunteers home and was throwing rocks at her in the garden. Human? And just, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This is a spirit. That was no, I know, but a human spirit. spirit or something else? Uh, we're not exactly sure. Okay. Might be just an irascible human. It might be something a little darker than that. We're, we've are we never really been able to figure that out. Is it a place, and, and sorry, to, I, I just curious, is it a place you yeah. think that it's just people have brought in energy to this place, or is it something with the building itself? Oh, I think it's the people that have been there for ages and ages. It's the Peoria Players Theater is the oldest uh, volunteer, you know, not professional theater. Yeah. Community, community theater, that's the word I'm looking for. The oldest community theater in the Midwest. So, yeah, we've been around for a long time, and a lot of people have seen a lot of really enticing, exciting shows there. Dramas, comedies, musicals. All um, the way back yeah, to 1919. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Dude, so that the, its really. walls are just soaked with energy. So. Oh, completely. Okay. Yes, very so, much. Speaker. So that was the that's the place that really made you think, okay, there's something going on to this. There's something. To yeah. This. Well, what happened was that the, the this group and I were we decided to go to another part of the theater. We decided to go up the stairs at the very back of the theater and sit on this little platform and continue talking to whatever it was that was up there. And I said, oh boy, this is this is where the nasty entity is and and i said i was still kind of a baby ghost hunter at that time and i said we're, <laughs> we're going lights out aren't we and the team leader said well of course we are <laughs> duh <laughs> <laughs> and, and all right fine i gritted my teeth and i I've, I've always been 
a little scared of the dark. If I'm if I've got somebody with me, I'm fearless, but uh-huh. I still am not crazy about it. So we go upstairs, and um, we sit down on these four chairs on this tiny, tiny little platform, and immediately I start feeling like I want to crawl out of my skin. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm so stressed. I'm just wound super, super tightly, and I, I, I grabbed a piece of rose quartz that I had in my pocket, and I, I concentrated on that, concentrated on good vibes, and we're kind of asking questions, and I, I feel myself all of a sudden start to relax. I'm like, huh, okay, this, this isn't so bad. And I said aloud, all right, you know what, This, I'm feeling better now. Yeah. And my friend sitting catty corner from me said, mm-hmm, and I kind of wondered why she said that, but I didn't pursue it. We were still doing our investigation. Yeah. And I realized just shortly after that that I could see the 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 lights on the stage were on, and I could we were high enough up that we were about ten feet off the stage, and I could look over and I could look past the backdrop and I could see the front of the stage, and I could see out of the corner of my eye this roiling, twisting blob of something hanging in midair, and it looked like rusty barbed wire. I couldn't see it when I looked straight at it, but I could definitely see it out of the corner of my eye. And you knew it was watching you, didn't you? Yes. I could feel it watching, and it was very creepy, but it was over there. Okay. And we got done with our investigation, and I, we were driving home, and I said, uh, my, my friend said, do you want to know why I said what I said in there when you said you were feeling better? I said, yeah, to share what, what was going on there. And she said, when you said you were feeling better, that was when Norman came from wherever he was in the theater and came to us and put like a protective bubble around us and chased that bad entity away and made it go over the stage. And he was protecting us. I said, well, how nice is that? That's, that's really kind <laughs> well, of Well, thank it. you. I appreciate it. <laughs> And, and and my friend said, don't you get it? Norman likes you. <laughs> oh, likes, <laughs> likes you or just? Uh, I don't think so. I'm <laughs> we're pretty sure he was gay, but he, he's friendly enough. Absolutely. All right. Well, cool. There is, a, there is a spirit at the Peoria State Hospital that like likes me. Oh, nice. You go. Yes. Chat. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We do. His, his name is Chris. She, he, he's he's in the basement of the Pollock Hospital. He passed away in about 1904. Okay. He said the last year he could remember is 1904. And um, he died of tuberculosis. He was only about 24 years old when he died. I, if I ever go there, and, I'm going to ask about you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask Chris oh, he's, about he's you. He's become very fond of me. Yes. He, uh, he he knows me. He's He has asked about me to other investigators. Oh, that's really cool. There. That's that's it's when things get interesting. Cool. Yeah. Sylvia Schultz, yeah. author on the line with me right now, uh, talking about the world of the paranormal. Uh, I uh, we, we should probably get to your book. I mean, I, I could sit and talk <laughs> just paranormal nonsense with you all day because I'm really into this stuff. And uh, you sound like you'd be fun to go investigate with. Well, thank you. I, I have a ton of fun investigating. I really enjoy it. I love the interaction that it brings with spirits. That's that's the cool part for me is the history and the interaction. Um, I had one more one more cool thing to say about yes. Chris. Yes, go ahead. If you don't mind. No, so, go ahead. Tell us about uh, more about Chris. Yeah, I, I was told by a psychic medium that he, she said he loves you but the reason he loves you he, he doesn't love you in a romantic way he says you remind him of his sister Ah. Uh. and then the more i've interacted with him the more i have come i i think he has come to see me as as more than just his sister <laughs> how has that not been He's, a movie yet <laughs> right he has sat and held my hand i brought in some ragtime music for him and played it for him because he he told me through a psychic medium that he was in quarantine so he could hear the music coming from the other other cottages when they would have dances on Saturday nights but he could not go and join in the dancing yeah and he missed that because he was in quarantine and then he died and I brought in some ragtime music for him and played it for him and he said no one's ever done that for me before well maybe they should have a little <laughs> so speaker thought, in there all the time yeah 
yeah, so I, I taught myself a ragtime dance and danced with him. And there was one part in this particular dance that the Did they video sing. you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to make fun, record- but did they did they video this? I recorded it. I, it was just on a voice recorder, but oh. I, there's no video evidence of this. <laughs> There's one part in the dance where the couple spins, and of course, like a dork, I spinned the wrong way. <laughs> and she said, the, the medium called from across the room. She said, he said you're trying to lead. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, yes, yes, I am. I'm sorry. My bad. Because <laughs> if there was video of him dipping you, that would be fantastic. Uh, that's all I'm saying. That would be amazing. No, that's and awesome. And there was one point in the investigation that I said, all right, Chris, you know, I, I know I'm probably not supposed to ask this, but if you can answer this question for me, I would love to know the answer. I said, what is it like where you are right now? Because he said he could go back and forth between heaven where his family is and the asylum where he passed away. So I said, what's, what's it like when, where you are right now? And he said, when you get to heaven, I'll be waiting for you. Just look for the tall guy with the dark curly hair. Well, that narrows it down, Chris. <laughs> and I said, that is one of the nicest things anyone, living or dead, has ever said to me. A lot of us don't get that. A lot of us get, are you going to clean up your mess? <laughs> I've actually never gotten that. I've I've never actually been communicated with with a with a spirit. Uh-huh. In that in that like I've picked up EVPs and that sort of thing, but never had the full on conversation. That's mm-hmm. very very cool, Sylvia. Very cool stuff. Uh, Sylvia Schultz yeah. on the line with me right now. You can find out more about her. Sylvia Schultz dot wordpress dot com. Uh, have the uh, she has the podcast lights out. You can check out. She's also a part of Ron's amazing show, Ghost Stories with Sylvia Schultz. Uh, you're also an author, as we've said. Gone on Vacation is the new book you've got out. And this is how I kind of came across you because, uh, as we were talking about earlier, we, we got hooked up because of uh, Troy Taylor, who's been on the show a couple times. But this is your new book, Gone on Vacation. This is Haunted Zoos, Museums, and Amusement Parks. Is this from around the country? Is it uh, a, a certain area? What, what are we dealing with this? It is all over the world. When I went to England, I was not able to visit any haunted zoos, but I did visit a couple of haunted museums. So that was that was definitely something I'd planned on for the book, and I was able to put those experiences in the book. So yeah, it's worldwide. All right. So uh, from around the world, which one sticks out to you? I have a real soft spot for the Museum of Haunted Things in uh, Haunted Objects in Nottingham, England. The the Museum of Haunted Objects haunted is what objects. it's called. I'm looking yes. it up as we speak here. Yeah, it's in Nottingham. Uh, yep. Oh, it looks cool. Oh, very cool. (laughs) They will not let you film or record or anything in there. Once you go past the gates, they'll let you film and take pictures in the gift shop, which also has a couple of haunted objects in it. But, really? Uh, Why not? Once you go past the gate, well, they they they're very they, they want you to come in and, and pay the admission ah, fee gotcha. <laughs> and see these things. <laughs> um, but they they have just fascinating things in there, and they I explained to them when I was there that I have a podcast and I was wanting to interview someone for the podcast because I was fascinated by it. And the girl at the gift shop counter got permission to go through the museum with me and talk about some of the artifacts, and she did allow me to record. So that's going to be one of the Lights Out shows. Oh, cool. Her telling me stories about this. And that's just, do they add to their collection as they go? Is it just, this is what we have? It is very much a work in progress. They do experiments with their artifacts. They have a haunted dollhouse. They have <laughs> um, talcum powder down in one of the rooms, and they have four cameras inside the dollhouse that are cameras that are going 24-7, and they monitor the cameras, and they found a child's handprint in the talcum powder. Oh, that can't be good. <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. stumbled across uh, their YouTube uh, uh, haunted museum. The Greta doll comes out to play. No, nope, so no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, yeah, she is creepy. 
<laughs> yeah, I think we'll we'll uh, wait to see that sometime down the road. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's another place that sticks out to you? Oh, boy. Well, another place I have a real soft spot for is I grew up in the Chicago area. So I have been to the Museum of Science and Industry and the Brookfield Zoo and the Lincoln Park Zoo and the Field Museum many, many, many times. And I was ever so thrilled to find ghost stories about all four of those places. Haunted zoos, huh? Yes, haunted zoos. What kind of haunting is happening there? Right. Well, people ask me, are these these zookeepers that are coming back? Are they... They can't be animal ghosts, can they? Well, yes, they can. The Cincinnati Zoo has a haunt, a, a phantom lioness that Weird, will follow really. you around. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Talk about thinking, um, it, now, feeling like something's watching you. Exactly. Now, she doesn't come out a lot. She she will only follow when there aren't a lot of people around, so it's kind of hard to zoo, hard to do in a busy public zoo. But if you find yourself walking along a deserted path and you get that sense of feeling being watched and you hear these stately, steady, great, big footsteps following you, these padding footsteps, and every once in a while she'll do that lion cough. Oh, (gasps) no. Like that. (laughs) No, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And there are zookeepers as well. Well, I mean, They're, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you think about a place that someone is going there and taking care. And I, 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 for the most part, you think of zookeepers as people that really enjoy those animals, taking care oh, of yeah, them and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you would think that that, it, and granted, that's not always the case, but it makes sense that you, they would. that may be their favorite place. Yeah, I did come across stories of that, of, of zookeepers that came back to their zoos because they loved it so much. The the Houston Zoo in Texas is haunted by the ghost of Hans Nagel, a zookeeper there back in the back in the day. He was quite the character. <laughs> he <laughs> he told people that he was born in Texas, but he wasn't. He was actually Dutch by heritage, and he was born in Germany. He actually, he was sent to officer training school as a young man, but he went AWOL and jumped ship, literally jumped into the ocean. Oh, wow. <laughs> and was was rescued by an animal collector who worked for the Hagenbeck Animal Company. That The Hagenbeck Company shows up so many times in the zoo section of this book. It's unreal. They were all over the place. So he made his way to Houston, Texas and became an animal trainer and became eventually became head of the Houston Zoo. Now he was this guy was banana pants. He was so much fun. He he would he would <laughs> go around the zoo <laughs> in, in 1926. He, he was he he would go, walk around the zoo. He was the director, mind. And he he would walk around armed with a nine millimeter Luger pistol, <laughs> and he was he was actually given a commission as a special police officer by the Houston Police Department. And in 1926, he discovered prowlers breaking into the zoo late at night and fired a couple of shots into the air as he was running them off. He got commendations for this. He was he, he took his job very. Very serious. I just love that you call them um, banana pants. <laughs> <laughs> he was just he was just a real character. He began to patrol the zoo grounds, but there were also park officers that patrolled the zoo grounds and they kind of locked horns every once in a while. And the situation kind of, uh, he he was stripped from being an honorary police officer by the mayor of Houston in 1929, but he still carried that pistol and he still thought of the zoo as his. And the situation kind of came to a head on Monday evening, November 17th, 1941. Nagel was, (laughs) this is going to sound horrible. (laughs) But Nagel was hiding in the bushes, keeping an eye on three teenagers who were sitting in a parked car. <laughs> That's not creeper behavior. Oh, no. <laughs> no, he, he sounds actual... just fine, Sylvia. <laughs> there was an actual police officer who was doing his rounds. His name was Harold Warren. 
and he noticed Nagel behind the bush spying on the teens. The hell are and you Warren doing? Went up to the, <laughs> Warren went up the car, went up to the car, and he asked the teens if they knew that they were being watched. <laughs> Oh. And um, it was at that this it was at that point that Nagel came out from behind the hedge, and confronted Warren. And the the officer firmly suggested that Nagel get in his patrol car for a trip downtown to discuss this jurisdictional dispute. <laughs> <laughs> and Nagel was not having any of that. He this was his zoo by God, and he was going to patrol it the way he wanted to. So Warren reached for his handcuffs and Nagel reached for his pistol, but he didn't even clear the holster. Warren emptied his service revolver into Nagel and killed him right there. Wow. Talk about something going dark real quick. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sylvia Schultz on the line with me right now, the author of Gone on Vacation. Uh, We'll have all the links to it at the bottom of the page and where you can pick it up because it is on sale now, correct? It is indeed, yes. Uh, Sylvia, as we get to kind of the end of this, uh, what else you got cooking? What's what's going on in Sylvia world? Oh, boy. Well, I have a series planned. I am expanding my wheelhouse a little bit into true crime. I realized when I was writing my book, Days of the Dead, A Year of True Ghost Stories, which incidentally won first place in the Book Fest Awards, so I'm not the only one who thinks it's good. As I was collecting the stories for this, I realized that a lot of these stories had their roots in true crime. We've got Lizzie Borden, we've got the Velisca axe murders, we've got all sorts of stuff. Boy, everybody wants to solve that Velisca thing. Oh, man, we've got so many suspects and none of them really work out <laughs> yeah there's a lot of and that's uh for anybody that may be listening outside of iowa Velisca axe murder house is probably one of the most well-known haunted spots in the state of iowa it's at least up there it's had it's you know been the one that's been on tv a bunch and so on and so forth so. oh yeah. yeah yeah tragic tragic story my uh. my folks have a weird story about that place that i i'll tell you later Ooh. Please do. And uh, um, a guy that was on actually on one of the shows, he he no longer ghost hunts because of Velisca. Oh, my. So, yeah, well, it's a, kind of a crazy place. But anyways, uh, so true crime is kind of where you're going, huh? Yes, yes. So I put together a, a book of true crime stories that have hauntings attached uh, called Grave Deeds and Dead Plots. And that is actually the first in a planned series. I have enough material for, gosh, five or six books. So I'm really looking forward to that. The project that I'm working on right now is straight true crime. I am co-writing a book with a a reporter from Evansville, Indiana, named Thomas Langhorn. And he and I both got fascinated with the Vicki White and Casey White case of last spring. This is where the... um, the Alabama jailer broke a prisoner out of jail. And oh, yeah. Him. Yeah. Yeah. I knew I knew the name. I, it wasn't registering for some, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly who you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. 11 day manhunt that culminated with Vicki shooting herself in the head and Casey being recaptured. So uh. we are writing a book about them. Boy, talk about a downer real quick there, Sylvia. Sorry. <laughs> I just reported. No, you're fine. You're fine. Okay, and all of this stuff we're gonna be able to find at Sylvia Schultz at WordPress.com, right? Absolutely. That's cool. All right. Well, Sylvia, I think that pretty much covers it for the day. I appreciate the time and gone on vacation out now, along with uh, a bunch of your other stuff. All of it Sylvia Schultz.wordpress.com. We'll have those links at the bottom of the page. Uh, she also does Lights Out uh, podcast and uh, is a guest on Ron's Amazing Stories, which I have Ron's website pulled up here. And I love his uh, like cartoon of him doing the <laughs> hitchhiking thing. <laughs> it's very, very oh, well done. Ron's a fantastic guy. He, I love Ron a bit. There you go. Well, Sylvia, it was nice to meet you. Thank you so much. And uh, we appreciate the time. Okay. Well, Adam, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it.